Okay. All right. So, um, this is my series on Maurice Nicole's book, Dr. Maurice Nicole, A New Man, Chapter 10. It's like most of these. I wasn't planning on doing this today, but I just, uh, it's such a beautiful day. So I grabbed the book on my walk. I have my dog with me. All right, let's start. I'm not at the ocean, but let me show you the ocean for one second. Well, I guess some of you are watching these in a row. It's all the way over there between the mountains. Let's see. It's pretty foggy, so we're not gonna see it over there. Come here, Leah. All right, chapter 10. Because this is a free copyright book. It's um, esoteric. Mystic Christianity, if you want to understand it that way. The inner interpretation of some parables and miracles of Christ. But if you just want higher consciousness and you want deeper understanding, this will help you. So I welcome all people. All right, good. Chapter 10 is on faith. What is faith? People may imagine that they know what faith means, but faith is not easy to understand. I remember my brother teaching me a Greek word. It's, um, well, I mean, I took Greek, but it's epi, epistasis. Um, I'm sure he'll have the Greek word for faith here, but it was to, stand outside of yourself stand outside of your own egotism stand it's like in the Christ consciousness if you want to understand it that way um, but nevertheless it's to stand outside of your everyday personality self that's part of it but let's see what Maurice Nicole has to say What is faith? People may imagine they know what faith means, but faith is not easy to understand. It's called in the Gospels a seed in a man's mind. Christ says, quote, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And he adds these strange words, And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Christ spoke these words to his disciples, when they had failed to cure the epileptic boy and had asked why they were unable to do so. The first answer to their question is because of your little faith. I was just reading this the other day. He's saying you didn't fast and pray. Sometimes you need to fast, but you fast, you fast not just from food or whatever, you fast, uh-oh, she's caught, okay. You fast from, um, your own. Oh, her little claw was caught. I'm sorry. You fast. Just a second, Leah. No wonder she was whining. Honey, I'm sorry. There. Oh, here. Little one. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry about that interrupt interruption. You fast from feeding your own egotism that's a kind of fast and it's a fast that is painful to our egotism it's a past a fast that's painful to our um our flesh our fleshly self our fleshly self never wants to fast that's why when christ says if you want to follow me you must die to yourself every day and leave your father mother brother sisters everything you leave um all these patterns of fear of, of trying to please all these people that you learned how to please in order to stay alive in childhood. That, it, that's a, it's a deep kind of fasting. This is why it's hard to describe faith because um, uh, 
I, I think when Christ was saying the road is narrow and few find it, he was speaking truth in a way. Um, let's let Maurice Nicole describe. Come here, Lele. Okay, so here's, here's the passage so we can get through this. Well, not just to get through it, just be present. It's from Matthew 17, verse 14 through 21. There came to him a man kneeling to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is epileptic and suffereth grievously. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oftentimes into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus had said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the devil went out from him. And the boy was cured from that hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast it out? You know, because Christ had taught them how to heal. And he saith unto them, Because of your little faith, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. I forgot to say, I don't know if I said, my name is Dr. Cheryl Meyer. I'm a psychologist in my um, everyday life and teach people how to follow their own intuition. And I have lots of different classes on that. Well, one main class, but you can take just three months of it. But anyway, I, I'm trying to make a practice of mentioning it now um, in all my videos. It's um, awakening your intuition through the power of now. Uh, it's, I was inspired by Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. And it really can transform your life and help you learn how to stop following your egotism and this takes time is why I did it over time anyway the disciples are told uh, they failed because they had little faith but in some ancient versions of the gospels Christ said to have replied that they failed because they had no faith and many commentators said say the words little faith were probably substituted as an interpretation of the original drastic words because ye have no faith among many other divisions in the Gospels, men are divided into those who have faith and those who have no faith. But it seems strange that the disciples who believed in Christ, who in fact are said to have given up everything in order to follow him, are told that they belong to those who have no faith. Let us try to understand what it meant. Faith is not, as people suppose, belief. Nicodemus believed in Christ because he, he wrought miracles. But Christ brushed this aside and said to him, Except a man be born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Faith is something more than belief. Christ defines it as a seed, and a seed is something that is organized and has its own life in itself and can grow by itself. If a man has a seed of faith in him, that man is alive exactly in the sense in which it is said in the parable of the prodigal son. For this my son was dead and is alive again. You will remember that in this parable it is said that the younger son came to himself, quote, came to himself, and turning around began to return to his father. That is to go in one direction. Let us consider first of all this idea of going in one direction in connection with the meaning of faith. And at the same time, let us understand that it is not easy to grasp what faith means. In the incident quoted above, when Christ was told that the disciples could not cure the epileptic boy, he at once exclaimed, O oh, faithless and perverse generation. It is of the greatest importance to understand these words because they throw the first light on the meaning of faith. What does this word perverse mean and why does it follow immediately after the word faithless? At first sight, there seems to be no connection between these two adjectives. This generation is called faithless and perverse. What is the connection? In Greek, the meaning of the word translated as perverse signifies turning in many directions. This means that to have no faith, to be entirely lacking in the quality of faith, hence to be faithless, is linked with turning in many directions, and so to have no one direction to follow. One, one telos. We've talked about that in other 
in other videos. You can start with this video or start with any of the other videos. But the telos is, is a Greek word for your aim. Christ says, follow me. Like, um, follow my commandments, which means the word entele. It was like, stay in this direction, in, in this higher aim, this highest aim. So anyway, so this means to have no faith, to be entirely lacking in the quality of faith, hence to be faithless is linked with the with turning in many different directions, and so to have no one direction to follow. What Christ is, says is, O oh, generation without faith, and turning in all directions. A man without faith, a faithless man, is perverse in this sense. He turns in many different directions, not ever knowing where he's going. And in ordinary life, people all the time are turning in different directions. At one moment, believing in one thing, or in one mood, and the next moment in another thing, or in another mood. Let me see if this person rode their bike up to watch this sunset. No, maybe they're just going by. And the next moment in another thing or in another mood. It is only necessary to observe oneself, to see the truth of this. Practice observing yourself. It's quite frightening. I've been doing that the past two weeks or so. Say hi, Leia. Leia, come here. Um, when you stop and notice your thoughts and don't judge them at all, but notice, be the observer of your thoughts, then it's, it's, it can be quite disturbing, but just don't judge any of the thoughts. Just watch and look at the pattern of what kind of thoughts you're thinking. Look at if they're judging other people or judging yourself or trying to prove yourself or... trying to figure out how you can get more and be more and do more. That's all egotism. That's all um, trying to control it all yourself. We just do this automatically. It's the, con it's the collective conditioning of, of mankind right now, but we're called to something higher than that. And, and you enjoy a much richer, richer life when you go beyond that. Anyway. You switch from your from mood being the anchor in your life, your mood, you know, directing you this way and that way and run after this and that to your mode, mode of being in your soul. But let me go back to the reading. The next moment in another thing or in another mood, it is only necessary to observe oneself to see the truth of this. Is it not true to say that one is turned in a different direction by nearly every book that one reads, every opinion that one hears, by every change of circumstance and fashion? I like how Einstein wore the same thing every day. I, I really consider that. I practically do. <laughs> Does not every mood paint life in different colors? But people imagine that they have permanent inner stability and it is true that as long as the general conditions of life remain the same, they feel a kind of stability, but is rarely due to anything in themselves. We have only to read history to see how aimless life is, in the deepest sense. The incident of the epileptic boy and the failure of the disciples to cure him, owing to their having no faith, is related immediately after the account of the transfiguration of Christ. After six days, Jesus take this is from Matthew um, 17 1 through 2 so in the same chapter after six days jesus taketh with him peter and james and john his brother and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and he was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his garments became white as the light wow there's another person and after they had come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, what did they meet? They met the dark, evil, insane world below, typified by the epileptic boy casting himself now into the fire and now into the water, surrounded by the multitude without faith and turning in all directions. This is the contrast that is drawn. Mankind without faith is like the epileptic boy. The boy described actually as being under the power of the moon. For in the Greek word, the word translated as epileptic means literally moonstruck, and so lunatic or insane. And we can see in this connection of narrated events and Christ's words, 
when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration to the level of life. Hold on. <coughs> Leia! That guy is super fit, and he looks like he's about 75. Oh. Anyway. Um, Let me see if I can get some of this light. She thinks she's protecting us in our house. So, so look at the epileptic boy. I, I have a feeling that Christ, you know, because he was Christ, and he was so conscious. He just manifested these things. He manifested whatever was necessary and they included it and taught about it to, you know, he, because they had just gone up high in a mountain, like we're up high in a mountain right now, you know, to be by ourselves, to hear these things in a quiet place with the sun in nature. You know, I'm just drawn to these when I teach these things. You go back down into the world and we enter back into our problems and everyday life situations. You can choose, Eckhart Tolle says, choose not to have any problems. They're just life situations. He says, isn't life hard enough on its own without call calling them problems, you know? Oh, I wish you could just be here and <sighs> there's the moon and just smell this air and be in this quiet. Wish I could live here. <laughs> Maybe that's why I make these videos, you know? Because I always want everyone to share this, this beauty that just shows up. It shows up where I am when I offer to, to, to make these things for other people, you know? Oh, look, I'm wearing Sun Studio. Like, who knew? I didn't know I was gonna make this today. All right. So lunatic or insane, and we can see in this connection of narrated events and Christ's words when he comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration to the level of life, a significant bearing on the meaning of faith. When it is said that Christ went up the Mount into a high mountain apart and was transfigured and literally in the Greek, this means metamorphosis or transformation of form, a going beyond all ordinary form, just as the word he has it in Greek, metanoia, where this, this finger is. Meta is metamorphosis and noia is your noose, which is like, I don't know how to describe it. I've asked lots of people. And I watched a really good video on it a long time ago on YouTube, a few years ago when I was in Turkey. Your soul's mind. He'll, he'll describe it here. So, um, it means beyond, going beyond what, this is how Maurice Nicole says it. It means, metanoia means a going beyond one's ordinary mind, one's ordinary forms of thought. The meaning is that a higher form of man exists as a possibility. And that faith is something that belongs to this idea about man, to the idea of the possible transformation of man. Christ was transformed before his three disciples. He showed them in some way impossible to understand and merely described in terms of ascending a high mountain that the transformation of man is a reality. He proved it to them in some way. How, we do not know, but they could scarcely comprehend it and not only were afraid, but as it says in one account, were so asleep that they could take nothing, take in nothing of what was happening until they were brought into a full waking state. Like I read one passage where it was saying he was shining like the sun, you know? I was gonna walk beyond this place, but then I got in my intuition to double back, you know? So I didn't, I don't always know the timing of these things. I didn't time it, but here we have, like the Mount of Transfiguration was presented here to us ourselves. So we could understand this on a higher level that your, our minds don't understand. If we're in a kind of matrix 
or something really beautiful here that we don't understand that has higher levels than just our physicality and our physical experience then things are arranged for us you know i just trust that so they were brought in this full waking state and luke this is put clearly enough in the following words now peter and they that were with him were weighed down with sleep but when they were fully awake they saw his glory luke 9:32. And it would be a great mistake to think that merely physical sleep is meant here. It was the daytime. Why should the disciples be heavy with sleep in the daytime? Even if they were, why mention such a detail? The sleep that is meant here is not ordinary sleep. In the Gospels, many words which have an ordinary meaning are used in a special way and have a quite different meaning. For example, the word dead, when used in the Gospels, does not necessarily refer to physical death. Dead people, from the point of view of the teaching about the man in the Gospels, are not the people in the grave, but people walking about. When Christ says, let the dead bury the dead, obviously, and that's in Matthew 8, 22, 22, obviously he's not referring to people who are literally dead. How can literally dead people bury literally dead people? Men are divided into the dead and the living with a special significance. The phrase, the quick and the dead, refers to people who have something alive in themselves, you know, quickened, quickened in themselves. <laughs> and to those who have not and are so dead already. A man immersed in life who can see nothing save the interest of the world, of power, of money and position and rivalry is dead. In the same way, men are divided into those who are asleep and those who are awake. The man who is beginning to awaken is a man who is not merely capable of comprehending meaning beyond the meanings of ordinary life, but is certain of its reality and to comprehend and then to be certain that there is meaning beyond life and that earthly life does not explain man, does not explain man is to begin to awaken from sleep. Sleep, earthly life does not explain man is to begin to awaken from sleep. The disciples were not literally asleep in the ordinary sense, but they were literally asleep in another sense. They were asleep to greater meaning. They were mentally and emotionally asleep to the idea of the ultimate meaning of human life that Christ revealed to them by his transfiguration. You know, and I would say only to those disciples too that were up on the mountain with him. You know, I mean, he showed it to the other disciples in different ways at different times, but at that moment, it was them for some reason. They were asleep to the whole idea of the transformation of man. For they are represented in many passages as merely believing that Christ was the destined Messiah, the deliverer of an oppressed nation, and that he was going to found a magnificent kingdom on earth in which they would occupy the highest positions and have the largest possessions and the greatest power. Remember, you know, John's mother was asking of her and her, if John and her other son um, could be at Christ's right and left hand you know, on the throne. So sometimes they were arguing who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, but sometimes they did think it was just a kingdom on earth. Anyway, and so blind to Christ's teachings about the kingdom of heaven and asleep to this idea of transformation of man, when in the presence of the actual manifestation before them, they were said to be weighed down with sleep. The quality of their minds, what is it, Leah? their degree of consciousness, their level of understanding could not reach to it. No man can realize anything or perceive the existence of anything that demands a higher mental and conscious state. Can you guys see nature? I know you can watch the sun as it's setting, but it's just so beautiful to watch the nature as well. Faith is connected um, due to their quality of consciousness. Hold on. But, oh, here. A man is asleep to what he does not understand. For the vast majority of people, whatever they are ignorant of does not exist for them, and they ridicule its possible existence. <laughs> These are among the ordinary limiting factors that confine mankind to its state. But there are special factors that limit even the most educated part of mankind due to their quality of understanding and the degree of their consciousness. Remember how Christ said you must be like a little child to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, people can have lots of degrees and education 
and not be aware of this higher state of consciousness of faith that Christ is showing us. Faith is connected with the idea of transformation, and so it is not mere belief on the ordinary plane, as when a person might believe in this man or not believe in him, as the case may be. As we shall see later in another narrative, bearing on the real meaning of faith, when the conversation of the centurion with Christ is mentioned, faith in its essential meaning denotes a conviction, a certainty that a higher interpretation of life exists. Mmm, I just read about that man. The centurion could see, could understand um, that, and I'm just saying this from what I read. I read it in a mystic book. That just like he had a lot of soldiers that did what he commanded and he could tell one and they could report to another that he understood that God could just send his healing angels to go heal his servant who was, who was like a son to him, the servant that was sick. And um, he just said, send, send your healing servants. And, and Jesus said, greater faith has he not found in Israel. Because this man understood the nature of... There's a hawk right above me. It's just sitting there. I, if I could zoom in, I would go onto it. But um, it just turned, looks like a speck on this. I can look. But... Faith is connected with the idea of transformation. Okay, so it denotes a conviction, a certainty that a higher interpretation of life exists, and as a consequence that the transformation of man is a possibility. This peculiar, the peculiar quality of faith lies in this idea, that life can only be understood and solved by the sense of something higher than man as he is, and that man has this possibility of becoming transformed and passing into entirely new meaning in regard to his life on earth. It is this per peculiar quality that is the essence of faith and renders it utterly different from what we usually call belief. Faith, in fact, undermines all our ordinary and natural beliefs because it leads away from worldly belief and in a direction that can no longer be confirmed by natural belief and the evidence of sense. And for this reason, it is defined as a seed in a man's mind. That is, it is the potentiality of a growth in a man's mind, which cannot exist in him as long as he believes that life as it is, is the end of man, and not a means to something else. For we imagine, if we imagine life is an end in itself, and the only end, we cannot possess faith and do not wish it. But if the thought enters our mind that thoughts occur to everyone, then precisely in this moment of new thinking, there is the foreshadowing of faith. Christ in the moment of transformation rep represents, you know, represents or represents man at a higher level of himself, a far higher level. His descent from the mountain, from the mount, represents the coming down to the plane of ordinary earthly life, a level of madness, insanity, a level governed, as it were, by the waxing and waning of the moon. And all these ideas are dramatized in the scene of the Mount of Transfiguration, and far below was the epileptic boy whom the disciples could not cure. It has been already seen, this is part two of chapter 10. Let me see. know if I finish this chapter. Let's see. It has already been seen that faith is compared with a living active seed in a man. It is not merely passive belief. In order to understand something further about the meaning of faith, let us look at what is said about the result of possessing faith. Christ says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, Nothing shall be impossible to you. And remember about dying daily, that the seed, and I think Maurice and Nicole will probably talk about this. I read this a, a while back. But 
the seed has to lose its outer shell in order to grow and burst forth through the ground. Hmm, there's little birds around. And so Christ says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible unto you. The result of having faith is that nothing is impossible to a man. The possession of faith renders what was impossible possible. It's like Christ walking on water, you know? When I met with a Native American Christian shaman, Red Elk, I met with him for three days a long time ago. About 10 years ago. He's passed on now. But he said, work the dream, Cheryl. We're all in the mind womb of God. We're all in God's dream. So work the dream. Once you understand that you are, it is like you break out of the matrix and you can understand with your higher mind, not with your mind here, how Christ could walk on water or walk through walls or disappear in the midst of the people that wanted to kill him when it wasn't yet his time to die. They wanted to stone him. And he says he walked in, hidden in the midst of them, you know? People won't read that as invisible because it's offensive to some, you know, because their their physical brain can't wrap their minds around it. But he's still following the laws of nature. They're just higher laws. And if you don't know them, if you know you're in a dream, you can do anything in the dream. But if you don't, you don't have that knowing, then you can't work the dream that way. People that don't realize they're dreaming may think they have to stay on the ground instead of fly. Anyway. The result of having faith is that nothing is impossible to a man. The possession of faith renders what was impossible possible. What do you want, girl? You want to get up here? There might be little critters that come out at night, so I got to go soon. In another place, in the corresponding account. Come here. Come here, love. I'm going to hold her, my love. Love her. Sit. 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 Good girl. In another account, let's see, in the corresponding account given in the ninth chapter of Mark, the phrase is, all things are possible to him who has faith. At first sight, it might be thought that this means that a man having faith has the power to do. But this is not quite what is said. The possession of faith renders things possible. And this is a different idea. To a man who has faith, things become possible that otherwise are impossible. It is not the man himself, but the faith in him that renders things possible. To a man of faith, all things become possible and nothing is impossible. Our ordinary idea of power is more or less connected with violence. For instance, people can be forced to obey, but the idea of power that is given by faith is different. In the presence of a man who really possesses faith in Christ's sense, things become possible. Such a man has power because through his possessing faith, all things no longer have their own power and so become possible to him. Things are robbed of their ordinary natural power and especially of harmful power. And this idea is often met with in the New Testament and in one place is expressed in the following words, quote, and these signs shall follow them that have faith, ellipsis, they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall in no wise hurt them and they shall land, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover you know like jesus went to the lepers and most people would stay far far away from them because they didn't want to get leprosy for the rest of their lives but jesus went and touched them and healed them um that was mark 16 it's roman numeral so that's why i pause sometimes 17 through 18. the robbing of the ordinary power of things by means of faith is shown in the above verse in this respect, faith is like truth. Truth has no power over lies, save by rendering lies powerless. For example, if a man allows the truth to enter his mind in the midst of all his lying, the lies lose all power over him, and for the moment he becomes sane. The disciples had done their best and could not cure the epileptic boy. They had used their powers, but as the Father tells Christ in the account in Mark, Quote, they had no force, end quote. That's Mark 9, 18. And Christ at once exclaimed, O generation without faith, how long shall I endure you? The disciples asked him privately why they failed. 
And the reply is, because you have no faith. The thing was impossible to them because they did not possess the smallest seed of faith. Yet they were the disciples of Christ. Nor would they have ha have faith after seeing the epileptic boy cured. But faith does not come from externally seeing miracles. And George MacDonald has a beautiful quote. George MacDonald is what, who C.S. Lewis considers his master. He said every book of George MacDonald's, he quote, every book of C.S. Lewis's, he quotes from George MacDonald, either directly or indirectly. But George MacDonald, I remember in one of his books, says, seeing is not believing. It's merely, it's just seeing. You're just seeing. I read one of George MacDonald's uh, books on my YouTube channel, The Princess and the Goblin. It's all about higher inner transformation. That's all it's about. But it's presented as a children's story. Sunset's just so beautiful right now. I'm looking at mountains. I was going to show the mountains, but... All right, here's where he goes. Here's the Greek word. It's epi... epistasis, but... It looks like this. This is pistis. P-I-S-T-I-S, -I -I if you would say it in English. Anyway. So, nor would they have faith after seeing the epileptic boy cured. For faith does not come from externally seeing miracles and passive belief in them. Because they had no faith, the cure of the boy was impossible for them. The situation was not, not, would not surrender to them. The situation wouldn't. The necessary factor to make the situation yield up its own power was lacking in them. I don't know what he means by when you're following... When you're holding on to lies and the truth comes in, you know, the truth is like, um, oh, the sun does really rise every day, you know, and let's say you didn't believe that. Once you saw the truth, then the lies would dissipate. It's like once light comes into a room, the darkness goes away. Something like that. So the situation wouldn't yield up its own power to them. The father of the boy says to Christ, if thou hast the power to help us, Christ explains, if thou hast the power exclamation point all things are possible to him who has faith the father despairing cries i have faith help my absence of faith i pray that a lot help my absence of faith and he did christ will every time you ask him both in mark and in matthew the accounts of the cure are used to bring a strong light to bear on the idea of faith and the power that results from its possession faith pistis which i showed you in greek um, is connected with a certain power Dunamis. That's the Greek word. I, I won't show you the book because I'm reading from a book right now, but it's free um, in, in ebook, but I just didn't print it out. So that is faith is dynamic in a special way. But the power of faith is not gained from outside, from position, from worldly power, or from anything external, nor is faith the evidence of things seen. It does not derive its power from that source. It is not formed in that external part of the mind that deals with life and things or with all the duties and cares of human existence. It is not on this level. It belongs to a level of mind above ordinary visible things. It is like a point offered to a man that lies above himself, you know? It is, as it were, as if he were to open a communication with the room of the floor above the room he usually dwells in where people live another kind of life and of which his own strength of conviction has led him to feel the existence and discover it for himself. For the idea of faith cannot be understood unless the idea of different levels in man is understood. Man does not live at the highest level of himself, 
A level awaits him. He is not complete. And he can only, he only can complete himself. Well, I mean, on a level, you can understand it that way. But I mean, God is the one doing it. He created the levels and calls us to those higher levels and transforms us and does all of the inner doing. But nothing external can complete him. That is, can bring him to this high, his highest development unless he is convinced that this is his real explanation. His mind remains shut to this possibility. That is, to anything higher. What is higher is in him. See, it is in him because we're made in the image and likeness of God. It's in us, but it is as yet unknown, unvisited. A new meaning arises in him when he feels the conviction of this idea. You see, because the son who was lost, like the prodigal son who was lost. Hi. <laughs> she thinks we're at home. Oh, there's another dog. Have a good night. I was saying evening and night at the same time. All right. Um, a level awaits him. He is not complete. And he can only, he only, okay. Nothing external can complete him. That is, can bring him to the highest development. Unless he is convinced that this is his real explanation. His mind remains shut to this possibility. That is, to anything higher. What is higher is in him, but it is as yet unknown, unvisited. A new meaning arises in him when he feels the conviction of this idea. A new period, a new birth is possible. Another level of thought and feeling and understanding is possible. A new man is hidden in every man. That's the title of this book. We, we finally got to it. This is the climax of the whole book. Right now, right as the sun's about to set. A new man is hidden in every man. For this reason, the Gospels do not speak of life or how to get on in life, but about this new man concealed in every man and woman, you know? Their teaching is about a higher level, that is, about the evolution of a man. The idea that a man or a woman can be different is not confined to the teaching in the Gospels. It's found in many ancient teachings. It's the only real basis of any psychology of man. The real psychology, even the word psychology, ology means study of, and psyche means the soul. And so I became a psychologist, always with the desire to study the soul, not like just the sciences that, that I got my doctorate in, you know? The real psychology of an acorn must be based on the fact that it can become an oak tree. Otherwise, its existence can only be accounted for wrongly and quite wrong views invented about it. If you only think an acorn is an acorn and you just tear it apart and look at its DNA and stuff and you don't realize what it can become, it has the possibility, the DNA in it to become an acorn tree, you know, then lots of people just think I'm already this faithful acorn tree and you're just still an acorn but don't despair with any of this don't despair you're here for a reason you know because you have a, a desire for something higher and maurice nicole doesn't own all of the truth here he's just speaking on it on a much deeper level than most people will but the holy spirit can like show this to someone in a country where in a you know aborigine tribe somewhere that has no education they can get this i heard a man they come to came to visit and he said the trees were 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 reading the psalms to his people because they had no books and i believe him like he literally said they but it's hard to convey into words i've i've had a lot of dinner different interactions with trees so i can understand how it's trans transferred it's not like words it's not like they're saying words but I wouldn't put it past them. Anyway. Um, so otherwise, its existence can only be accounted for wrongly and quite wrong views invented about it if you only think an acorn as an acorn. In the structure of the nervous system, we find many different and quite distinct levels, one above the other, where things are arranged and represented in quite different ways. A lower level cannot understand a higher one and a, like a snail can't understand a human being. And like what um, this conversation I had this afternoon with someone, a snail cannot understand that. That's a lower level of operating. 
So um, a lower level must obey a higher level because it surrenders its power to it. So it says a lower level cannot understand a higher one and a lower level must obey a higher because it surrenders its power to it. Ah, uh, wow. Wow. That's why when you yield on a new way and let go of something lesser, something the world, the flesh, or the devil calls you to run after, or whatever you want to call it, you, when you surrender that and actually like step into the water, like I, I, was, I read that in a Torah commentary one time, that Moses, like they stepped into the water up to their chest, chest high, you know, your heart's level, and then the water opened up. Um, it's like that. When you, when you choose to walk in faith, then all these new understandings come to you that you could never have seen unless you had surrendered to that higher level. But they're saying, once you're operating from this higher level, the lower one has to surrender up to you, kind of like the epileptic boy. There's another bike. It must obey a higher level because it surrenders its power to it. A man has only to think- <coughs> Leia, Leia, hi. hi. A man has only to think of moving his arm and then he can do it, or the woman. All the lower levels obey the thought. So a man working through the evidence of his senses or her senses and thinking at the, that mental level cannot understand faith. Faith is already the absolute certainty of a higher level. And so already it opens the influence of a higher level to act in a man or a woman. Let us look in the connection at another parable. He wrote this in like the 1920s. So I try to add the woman here sometimes at another parable about the meaning of faith expressed by means of the incident of the centurion. Oh good, we get to read the centurion. At a cer cer certain, certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him. Oh, see, I read how dear he was in a mystic book, but you don't have to believe that. He was sick and at the point of death, you know, in this mystic book, it said that the child's mother and father had both died. And so he took him in and he was like a son to him, but Anyway, he was dear unto him, he was sick and at the point of death. And when he heard concerning Jesus, he sent unto him elders of the Jews. This is a, a Roman man, but he had made them synagogues and stuff. And this little, t anyway, I won't say all. And they, when they came to Jesus, they besought him earnestly saying, he is worthy that thou shouldst do this for him. For he loveth our nation and himself built us our synagogue. Oh, good, it says it. And Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter to come under my roof. Hi. Hi. I'm just making a video. Do you mind? You can keep doing oh. this. No, no, no. I'm just saying, don't mind me talking, but enjoy the sunset, right? It's so beautiful. Um, so... Um, So it said that Jesus went with them. And when he was not that far off from the house, he sent friends. Oh, yeah, because if he was a centurion, if he was like a Roman soldier, then he had been like killing people, you know. And so like didn't feel like he was worthy for someone to come in, even to heal someone that was innocent, like the boy in his house. I'll walk over here. Oh, it's awesome. It's a, a, kid, a kid came up, right? A kid came up. I, I don't want to put kids on my videos ever. So anyway, so, um, hi. So, um, for he loveth our nation and himself has built a synagogue. And so he says, I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say the word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under myself soldiers. And I say unto this one, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned and said unto the multitude that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. And they were sent, returning to the house. They found the servant whole. Aww. He was whole. He was completely healed. Mm. I know a woman that died today. They took her off life support. We were praying for her. 
it's like life is so so like that you know I'm not certain she died. I was hoping that some miracle would happen, that she's alive, but I think we would have heard. But anyway, this boy was made whole. For whatever reason, he was sick at the time of Christ, and this man asked for him to be restored, and he did. Why should Christ say here that he has never met with greater faith? The centurion expressed in his words the essential idea of faith. He knows from his experiences as a soldier that there is a higher and a lower, that is, what is above and what is below him. And from this, as a result of his own thought, you know, and whatever made him inclined to keep making their synagogues for them, you know, even though it wasn't his religion, as a result of his own thought, he's convinced. I can't believe that. So it was so quiet and then this other people came up and they're just talking and talking about I don't know what, you know? So weird. It's so, um, anyway. So convinced that a higher and lo lower level exist, not only in the external visible world. The centurion says, neither thought I my myself worthy to come to thee. He didn't think he was worthy to even ask Christ, so he sent the people that were, you know, of Jewish descent. What is it, Leia? Look at this. All right. So the centurion understood levels of man. Okay, so Neither thought I myself worthy to come to thee. Here the words, word worthy means in the Greek, on the same level. I didn't think myself on the same level to come to thee. Are you okay, Leah? The centurion understood levels of man. He understood that everything is a question of levels. That is, he understood higher and lower as a principle. And he knew that a lower level must obey a higher level in the very nature of things. He knew, first of all, that Christ was on a higher level than himself. He realized that all that Christ did and said was from a higher level than the level that he, the centurion, acted and spoke from. In the second place, he knew that Christ also obeyed a higher level, just as he, the centurion, obeyed those over him who had greater authority than he possessed. And in how many places in the Gospels does not Christ indicate in the clearest way this obedience to what is higher? He was not free. He was not obeying another will. And through, through this had power, what power could the centurion possess if he did not obey those over him? By obedience to those above him, he had power over those below him. None of his soldiers below him would have obeyed him unless he himself obeyed those above him. He understood this and so discerned the source of Christ's power so that Christ exclaims, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. People didn't understand it on this level. Since the idea of faith is connected with the power of making things obey, it is clearly also connected with the power that a man may gain over himself in the sense of making all that is in him, all his different desires, different momentary wills, different thoughts, moods, etc., obey something in him, owing to the fact that this something in him is of such a great, such a nature that it deprives all these different things of any power to affect him. The Greek word for faith, pistis, is from the verb pitho, P-E-I-T-H-O, -E which means to persuade or to make obey. What in a man will make all sides of himself obey him? What persuasion in his mind will bring him into a position where everything in him will yield its power to him? If a man could find the secret, he would master himself. He would be master of himself, not directly through his own power, but through the power given him by faith. 
This is why it's power that's given to us by faith to disentangle ourselves from our egotism. This is how I read it the other day in a mystic book that was so good. I don't want to mention it because I just can't. I could, but I... But you can't, you can disentangle yourself through, through um, the power that is given to you and your mind using that power. It's okay, Leah. All right. So, um, it's just here that a man must create himself. And this task of self-creation cannot be haphazard. It must be based on ideas that transcend ordinary meanings. To believe in what we can see does not create us. Out of all we witness, we may pick out this or that aspect and hold to it as truth. But such truth is external, and its source is from visible life. The source of faith is from invisible. The source of faith is from invisible life. The disciples had no faith because they were merely impressed by Christ as an extraordinary man and by the miracles. And in a sense, as long as Christ was among them, a visible body, they could not have faith and so could not create themselves. In a sense, Christ tested them by being rough with them. Christ offended people right and left. Even his disciples, like many others who listened to his teachings, were afraid to ask questions. It's said in Matthew that after Christ had confounded the Pharisees, who had said that the Christ was the son of David, by the words, if David called him Lord, how was he a son? <laughs> Jesus said, if David called um, Christ his Lord, how was he his son? Because he says, I was here before. Anyway, no one was able to answer him. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions, end quote. And we read in Mark that even the disciples, when Christ was teaching them, about his coming death and resurrection, under, quote, understood not the saying and were afraid to ask him, end quote. The object was to make them believe not because of, but in spite of all that took place. And the crucifixion, the most dishonorable of all forms of death, was in itself a test apart from its other meanings. <sighs> then after they were left only with what they had been taught, with certain strange ideas, parables, sayings, and perhaps with very much of what no record was ever attempted. They had to turn all that they had seen and heard, all that they had taken in by the channel of the senses into the living seed called faith. They had to be deprived of its outer basis before it could be established in them on a new basis according to the promise that Christ had made to them. Quote, the Comforter, even the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I said unto you. John fourteen twenty six, And John is the mystic disciple. People either argue that God does not exist because horrible things happen on earth, or they say, if anything higher exists, why are we not told exactly what it is and what we have to do and so on? To the first argument, the answer has been given. It is expressly said that God's will is not done on earth. To the second answer is that people cannot evolve, that is, come into a new birth of themselves by merely external example or indeed by any form of thought or any based on the senses. Truth that can work in a man towards self-change can be sown into him by the channel and must be, but by itself falling on all that is sense-based in his mind, it, it falls by the wayside. You know, that parable of the seeds that fall by the wayside are choked up by the riches and cares of this life. And it is destroyed. I was, I was like crying yesterday about that. I saw an area of my life that that happened in. Anyway, and it is destroyed. A man must hear and receive beyond himself, beyond anything that he has acquired from contact with ordinary life and its problems and proofs, beyond all ordinary notions and his limited powers of comprehending, which he has got from time... Hold on, I only have one hand right now. Leia! Oh, good. From time and space, we're about to end. 
I, I gotta go before the coyotes come too, I'm gonna tell you. Like, I have faith, but um, I'd also, I don't, I don't want my dog to, to perish because of any kind of lack of faith. Help my unbelief. Um, anyway, everything that can, everything that can renew, regenerate, and change in him, change him, must be raised up beyond that level simply because its true function is to open up in him another level. Oh, now I'm, I ought not to have said that. <sighs> okay. Simply because it's, its true function is to open up in him another level. So it is germinal, like a seed, germinal, G-E-R-M-I-N-A-L. And through, and though coming from outside is of a higher destiny and belonging to a higher degree of a man and is in short, the first of a series of connecting ideas and thoughts, the first ferment or leaven. Leia, sit. Good girl, good girl, good girl. She wants something in the in the bushes. Um, that uh, so it first must for, first ferment or leaven that leads to a communication with that higher level and a transformation in understanding the meaning of a man's life on earth. For if we think of the evolution of a man as the inner connection up with an already existing possibility, just as an oak tree is a possibility in an acorn, being a higher level of an acorn. And that this connection up can only be possible through a growing intensity of insight and connect conviction, which enables a man to tilt the balance in himself, as it were, and point in a new direction. In this one and single direction that Christ is so constantly speaking of in metaphor and parable, then we can more easily understand that pa passive belief through what the senses prove is useless and that faith must be something alive and constantly at work in a man to affect its supreme art. It's alchemy. I talk a lot about alchemy in lots of my videos, which is the creation of a new man in a man, in a woman, a new woman, and or new being, you know. And in this process, the laws of another order higher than his own must begin to influence and affect a man just as for an acorn to undergo a latent possible transformation it must begin to obey the laws of oak trees and gradually cease being an acorn at all all right much love it's getting dark i know it doesn't look it here but oh the ocean's right there all right thanks so much for being here Please share this with other people that are interested in this. Share my channel, share all my videos. I appreciate that you giving energy back um, so that I can grow my channel and actually start making living this way because I love, I love giving in this, in this capacity. And um, I also need to make a living. <laughs> all right, much love. I, trust, I just trust and have faith. All right, bye.